Hi, I'm Joan and Only, and I'm Jeffers, and I'm Calvarina, and we're from Joan and Only. We already said that, I know. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Hi, I'm Jersey Three, creator of Joan and Only and a lot of other crazy ass stuff out there. And you can find my stuff online at joanandonly.com or white2cl.net. And you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented comic creator, podcast host. I've known him for about 20 years, basically. He's been on the show many times in the past, talking about his newest returning comic series, which is currently on Kickstarter. And we're joined by the ever-talented Jay Horsley III from Y2CL, Spoiler Country, and of course, Johnny Onley there. Thanks, Kurt. Yeah, it's a it's Jolene only, which is fine. Everybody everybody says it wrong. <laughs> but yeah, it's like the word only with the J in, in front of it. So Jolene only, which is a ridiculous comic series that has way too many books out or coming out. <laughs> but it's par for the course for you, though. I mean, quite literally. It really is. Whenever you're on the show, you're either doing five or ten things behind the scenes other than what you're currently talking about. That's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and that's got- not going to change either. <laughs> It's not. It's not. I am getting better about focusing right now that lately, though. I was I was diagnosed with ADHD, and I've been doing some things to try to learn how to manage that um, last year. Mm-hmm. And I've learned how to focus better, which is why things are getting completed now. But I still have a bunch of stuff in the background that I'm working on. But I'm learning how to like not do that all the time and like try and focus on what I'm trying to get done right now, which which is working. So I finished a novel this year. I finished this book this year. I finished a couple other books this year. Like I've got like the next like four books that are coming out. They're already done. So it's, I've, I'm actually finishing things now, which is really cool. That's awesome. We're jumping ahead of ourselves as we usually do. Yeah. And it's, it's because we know each other so well that we could just dive into a conversation. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. I am uh, Jay Horsley the third. I've been making comics since 2003 uh, with web comics and I've been podcasting since 2009. been doing creative stuff my whole life uh, i started creative web comics with a comic called ytcl which was basically the proto version of Joan and only where it was a little bit better art or real art and then became other stuff i did a, a book called the Einz anthology which i'm still working on um which i kickstarted a couple years ago which was a horror series which was did really well i decided i wanted to release Joan and only and uh, i went through and created a 150 page book i've already got the next 150 page book done as well and I've got a lot more in line for it too. It's just, it's a ridiculous moronic comedy series where it's a bunch of guys and a girl talking about life and stuff. There's a bunch of stupid jokes. There's a bunch of educational stuff in there, like legit educational stuff in there for whatever reason, because I felt like talking about things and like giving actual facts in the book. I did a lot of research for it too, which was kind of funny because I'm like, why am I doing so much research for a stupid dick and fart joke book? But I did. So all the facts in the book have been actually researched and like verified, which is, which is hilarious to me. Which not a lot of people can say about their creative works, though. There's a whole series where one of the characters, Cal Brain, it becomes like a professor and he's teaching in a class. And every lesson he teaches you, there's there's some stupid joke in the lesson, obviously. But all like the things he talks about are 100% true and 100% research and fact, factual. Because I thought it'd be hilarious for a stupid ass comic to have like real facts in it and like, real stuff in it. So I did it. It, it makes me laugh. Every time, every time I read it, it makes you laugh. They're like, oh, yeah, he's talking about, you know derotosomes or like science or neptune and stuff like that but it's all like legit facts when you were researching this stuff which one of those jokes were your favorite to write in and it just all came together wonderfully oh the um derotosomes joke where basically every everybody starts out as, as an asshole because it means everybody starts out with the mouth and their butthole touching Karina says he likes being called an asshole because it means he's just like everybody else because everybody else everybody's born an asshole and but there's a whole explanation about it more in the book which is pretty funny it makes me laugh because it's just ridiculousness, you know. <laughs> Your sense of humor has always been like that, though. You have the ability to, pardon the expression, crude when you need to, but it's hilarious. You put thought into in the jokes you put into the books itself, too. And even going back as far as the comic cookbook, when you put in a recipe yeah. for that as well, too. Cannibal chicken. Like, uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah, <laughs> just the subtlety of that alone was just hilarious. I loved it. <laughs> I like, to, I like to, to push the boundaries just a little bit, just enough to make myself go, yeah, I'm. it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's hard about being creative in, in today's world now, too, because back when, when you created the comic series and everything else you've done, when was this series created, first off? Uh, Jolene only came to be, the, I published the first webcomic for it in uh, middle of 2008. 
been around basically as long as this show has been been around. Yeah. Right? The comedy scene has changed a lot since 2008. I mean, what we get away with back then versus what is considered funny today is completely different. How is this type of book going to, we already know it's pushing the boundaries, but is it going to be as well received in today's comedy climate? Uh, I, you know, I thought about that a lot, actually, because I, I reread a lot of my old, old stuff recently. And I'm like, man, this would not fly today. And it's, the, the jokes would not land the same as it did today. The beauty of this book of Jillian and Only is that while there's a lot of crude humor in it, it's without like giving too much away of like the quote unquote story, I guess, of the book. It's not really a, it's not really a story of the book. I mean, there's kind of a loose story in them. They're mostly just a series of jokes wrapped around a, a loose plot. But one of the, the tropes of the books that I put in there is there's a lot of crude humor and a lot of like for lack of a better word, offensive jokes, but there's a lot of explanation of those jokes, why those jokes are said, why they shouldn't be said. And even so much as putting like some history of the offensive terms of why they shouldn't be used in certain contexts. There's a lot of like education around the social awareness stuff of these, of these offensive jokes. So I don't shy away from making the jokes anymore. I am a character in the comic, right? There, you'll see, you'll find pictures of me interacting with the characters in the comic, which is strange. But then there's also caption boxes, right? So I have caption boxes like they help move the story along. Eventually there becomes three caption boxes and they're all different versions of me talking to myself in the comic. And they, they reference the comics, they reference the characters. Sometimes the characters talk to the caption boxes, um, but they basically go through and like, ex not really explain, but like make commentary on the stupid shit that's happening in the book. So there's this whole running thing throughout all the books. And there's just so you know, there's, five issues in this book the next chapter is another five issues that's already done the next chapter is seven or six six issues it's almost done and then chapter four is eight issues and it's 65 percent done so there's like up to issue 25 or 26 is already written out and in some stage of being completed but in each of them there's this underlying byline of the the caption boxes and sometimes me i come into the comic too not necessarily to explain things but to kind of like give commentary on some more perspective on what's being said or why it shouldn't be said kind of thing, you know? Because yeah. one, I thought it was hilarious to do it that way because in my head, I was writing it and then I go back to letter it and, I'm, and I, I should say this, I should add this, I should add this. And I end up with all these caption boxes. I'm like, there's like two stories going on. There's like the comic page story and then there's a caption box story going on on most of the pages. It just become a fun little way for me to talk about the way that jokes have changed and kind of talk about the way society has changed while still being able to comment on it in both the, let's make a, a joke that's in bad taste and then let's talk about it. It's interesting that you're throwing in the narration side of things as well, too, because it's almost like a behind the scenes of the behind the scenes type deal. Of right. Just your mindset when it comes to these types of jokes. Your wife is included in this book as well, too. She's a big part, obviously, of this series. How's that back and forth when it came to the the rewriting of the book and going back through all this stuff? Was she like, yeah, this this just isn't going to work? You know, I, I, can, I know it's your humor, but really, like, come on now. It's so funny because I, I, her name's on every book, right? She's on her name's on every book, on everything. Jillian Millian, I've always included her name because she created the characters, right? The whole story of the creation of Jillian Millian is I had the White to Seal comic book, which was like, you know, me and my friends doing stupid stuff. And one night laying in bed, she was, we had like a little sketchbook. We were drawing stuff back and forth. And then she drew a picture of me, which became the Jillian Only drawing. And she named it Jillian Only. And then she drew a picture of my friend Jeff and named him Jeffers. And then she drew a picture of my friend Calvin and named Calvarina. She wrote a little joke about with those characters and stuff like that, which uh, the original Jolene and Only comic strip is included as a bonus thing in the uh, the trade. So people can see that the original version of the comic that she drew. The first couple of jokes that in the, for the webcomic, you know, she wrote for them. They're just, you know, just some stupid jokes she wrote. And then I kind of like took it into Illustrator, vectorized the characters. I could move them around and make them kind of like cartoony characters. And then I just ran with that. And really her contribution is creating the characters, writing the first couple of jokes, naming the characters, and then being kind of a sounding board for stuff sometimes. But for the most part, she's just like, I can't believe you put my name on this shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, she supports it. She loves it. She thinks it's hilarious. There's a reward on the Kickstarter right now that you can get a sketch cover from her if you want to. It'll look like the only, the only characters, but it can, it'll be a sketch cover. She loves it. She doesn't do much of the writing anymore on it. It's mostly just me doing it, but she does, she does read over it or she does look at it sometimes and go, oh God, what are you doing? <laughs> To be fair, you, you both said I do to each other. So, I mean, it's you true. take the good with the bad, right? <laughs> it's true. It's been uh, 17, almost 18 years now. Wow. So That's amazing. That's wonderful. Yeah. And it's great to have that type of wonderful 
sounding board in, in person in your life, especially when it comes to the creative process. Because I'm sure if you live in your own bubble, as you as creative people do, you know, you don't have any way to vent any way to really say, hey, is this a good idea? Is this? Yeah. Can I can I push this or can I create something similar to this? You know, what are your thoughts? I mean, we have that online, but when you're living with someone 24 yeah. seven, you have something a, a bit of more flexibility when it comes to the creative process. Well, and she's not shy about telling me something stupid either. So. <laughs> <laughs> she's not shy about it and someone's like oh that hurt my feelings but whatever you know feelings it's fun i love i love sitting here stupid stuff and her going i love when i can sit her on, on her computer and she just i just hear a oh god <laughs> like that's a good one then that's a good one <laughs> the kickstarter campaign is currently ongoing you're 71 percent funded based on this yeah. particular interviews so you're not shy from kickstarters you've done many kickstarters in the past what is it about this particular campaign that you're trying to do a little differently so this one it's different than most campaigns that I've done before because the book's already done, all of the work is already done. So really it's just a matter of kickstarting it, find people who want the book and then paying for printing costs. It's really is all it is. One of the things I've done with this one that I didn't do with other ones is, which I, I saw it because a lot of people are doing it. And it's, I know it's popular in the comic world, doing variant covers. You know, I, got, I hired some artists to do variant covers for certain uh, issues in the book. I love them. They're great. I hadn't done those before. Like on Ions, I didn't do any variant covers. There was just the softback, the hardback and the sketch cover. That, that was it. And the sketch cover was just a version of the softback that was sketched on. I did really well without, without variant covers. This one I did variant covers on because I was like, well, I know Joe Lenoni is a hard sell. Like, unless you read it, if you look at this, like the art's not captivating, you know, the art's not great, right? But it is what it is. It's that way for the jokes and for the book. And it may, once you read it, it makes sense why the art's the way it is. But getting people to read it is the hard part. So I was like, well, let's use another, uh, I don't want to say gimmick, but another comic book gimmick is to do variant covers or to do this extra stuff that people like. So I did those. Which are fun. So I, I did a, a Rom Sandoval did a homage cover to Green Lantern 85, which is the Green Lantern where he's uh, speeds on drugs, but instead of it being drugs, it's covering and masturbating. You know, it's just, it's ridiculous stuff. I had some other other cover art done. Um, I did a, a, a Halloween like horror variant cover for fun, which which sold pretty well. It's just a lot of trying new things on this picture. Right? My goal is low, which is fine because I just want to print it. I'm trying some rewards and some add-ons to see how they do for future campaigns because. Right before this one started, we did um, Supernatural Baby Detective with a co-host of Foyer Country's book that I colored, Kenrick. And uh, we did that one. And that one we was more of, it's more of a traditional like horror Supernatural books. That one did really well. So I took some of the stuff we did on that one recently because the last one that I did for just my book was in 2019 for Eins. One, Kickstarter is different. The world is different. And this is a very different book than Eins. So a lot of the stuff that worked on that one, I didn't know if it was necessarily going to work on this one. Yeah. So I've tried some of that stuff. Some of it has worked. Some of it has not worked, which is fine. It's always a learning process when you do Kickstarters. It's always trying to figure out what the tone of their current uh, market is because it's always changing. It's always changing. Especially with comics and Kickstarter, you're going against a lot of other comic books that are are definitely not in, in the same genre as you, but yeah, they have more eyes on it. I mean, the promotion side of things, I'm sure, is standard difficult when it comes to everything like that. You're fighting against noise, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and it's it's hard to to go against, you know, especially with the way social media platforms are, with the way algorithms are that keep constantly pushing down people that are trying to promote themselves. I, I mean, power to you because you're getting things succeeded and funded and and put out there, but it's got to wear on you. It does. It does. I've been nonstop doing promotion every day for this, this book, but the best I can, like, I haven't done a lot of like video stuff because my work schedule is so crazy. Mm. So I'm doing a lot of like graphics for Instagram and for, for Facebook and Twitter. I do a lot of Twitter stuff because it's easy to do while I'm working, trying to do as many interviews as I can, but I haven't been able to do a lot of them because again, my work schedule has been freaking crazy. Mm -hmm. And this is a hard book to sell on without people knowing what it is, because like you said, there's not a lot of people in this genre of what I'm doing. Cause I don't even, I, the genre for this book is like irreverent humor, self-referential comics, uh, self-aware comics, uh, humor, stuff like that. And it's it's hard to sell that without somebody reading it. So I'm trying to like, when I post it, post it on Twitter and stuff or comment on some like, you know, share your work thread, I try and write something unique each, each time to like kind of capture the best I can in like two sentences what Jillian only is, you know, which is ridiculousness, self-awareness, and moronic humor kind of all or up to the one or, or, I, or I'll throw in like the educational aspect or I'll throw in other aspects of the book trying to keep people to come in, but it's hard because I'm on, I'm in these collab groups with other people who are running comic stores right now. And none of their books are like my book, which is, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but like, you know, they are doing these normal books. Uh, normal, I mean like actual comic books or stories and stuff like that, which is great. And those are awesome. It's easy for me to cross promote, like for me to promote their stuff. Cause that's 
easy. Yeah. But it's hard for them to promote my books to their audience because the audience for Jolene and Only might not necessarily be the same audience for uh, a superhero book, right? Or a horror book or something like that, which it's interesting because I, I think a lot of those people would cross over, but they have to like take the time to read it, which I know is hard to get people to read things. Mm-hmm. I've been fighting a pale that battle for the last, you know, two weeks to try to be like, hey, get people to know what it is. Yeah, you know, I've been posting a lot of like page samples. So we're going to read through the page and stuff like that, which we've been doing, doing okay. Uh, just trying to get into like, you know, give it a chance. It's it's funny. It's stupid. It's got a lot of fun stuff in it. I think if people read it, they'll enjoy the characters. The people who have read the book have told me the characters are endearing. The characters, you know, you watch them grow from issues one through five and onwards. If you like it or not, you're going to learn something because each book has some kind of, not a lesson, but like some educational aspect to it that by the end of the day, we've learned a new word, a new term. Like one of the books, I think it's, I think it's book three or book four. There's a whole page that goes over and I'm not going to say the words. I want people to read the book, but there's an, actually an actual term for people who are authors who write their books specifically about having sex with young boys. And it's been a trope in authorship for 250 years. And there's a lot of big name authors who fall into this word that were part of this society in England that their thing was they wanted to write about basically pedophilia. But they did it in a social, a quote unquote, socially acceptable way. And there's a whole like society for it. There's a quote unquote club for it. There's a name for it. And I found this out and started researching it. It was a very gross thing to research, but I did. And I wrote about it in the book for a little bit. It's a whole like, it's got two pages to talk about this, this term, how like fucking gross it is. <laughs> and there's an actual society for this. Like, why, why, why is this a thing? Why? No, this is gross. Stuff like that is thrown in a mix, also mixed with, you know, masturbation jokes. Well, it all wraps around. <laughs> But I remember watching some of your early social media promotion where you were doing like nice, quick, short videos as well, just to talking about it. And I thought that was a very great way to just kind of get a quick blip of, hey, look, this is coming out type deal. And obviously it's, it's time consuming, especially with the edits. Maybe yeah, I've, 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 I've written some scripts to do for like, uh, with I don't know if you saw the ones on, on TikTok where I had mm-hmm. the little cutout characters. Yeah, I saw uh, those. I've written some scripts for those to do more of those videos because those, those did pretty well on, on TikTok. I'm going to do some more of those because I got a whole like drawer of little cutouts I made, which I actually made not for this. I made for, there's a whole like section of one of the books where there's the characters break into reality. I broke them into reality by doing cutouts of them. But I was making the TikTok, and I was like, I'm going to use the characters. I'm going to have them talk. So I grabbed them and had them talk. And nice. I have some stuff written for that. I'm gonna, I'll probably, I think I'm going to film some more this next week and post them up because I got I got some time this coming, coming week. But yeah, those were fun to do. Those were fun. I enjoyed it. I thought it was just a, a nice break compared to just simple talking heads or whatever like that. And yeah, it was just something unique. And, and, and that's the thing. You have to be creative with this type of short attention span when it comes to any content you're trying to create especially your comics and especially with anyone else you do what you can to get the eyes on it as you can and you know you got to keep pushing yeah always always pushing in some in in some way actually i'm going to a comic show today in uh tacoma washington and i'm going to be promoting i made a bunch of flyers for joan the knowing that i'm going to be passing out to people and putting on the free table trying to get people to to check it out okay i'm a local creator check it out check out my book so we'll see how that goes. And I put flyers in. I, my friend has a, not a comic shop, but it's like a retro shop where they have like retro games, retro records and toys. So I put some flyers there yesterday too. So there, hopefully people there see it and trying to promote it. I'm trying to just trying to think of things to promote the book that are a little bit not your standard mm-hmm. because Joel and is not your standard book. So if you read the Kickstarter, like when you go to, when you, do, when you go to a Kickstarter, people have like the, what is this section where they write out what it is. Well, I decided to, instead of doing that, I would just make two comic pages of Joan and only the characters talking about what the Kickstarter was. Because again, they're self-aware characters. They know they're in a comic book. So I had them do the intro to the Kickstarter. So I made two pages of them talking about stuff. And then then I flipped it out to me talking about stuff. And then, so there's a lot of like the promotion is not me promoting the book. It's them promoting the book because that's on brand for the book and on brand for the characters of them talking about stuff versus it being just me. So trying to think of ways around that to do different stuff like that but it's been it's been fun and it's been unique and it's been challenging to to try and not always just do the same thing i find that when it comes to the the creative process we kind of get into a a lull or into familiar habits when it comes to this and and we we get sucked into the trends of of social media promotion you look on instagram you're going to see five different so sponsored advertisements or posts that are just the same thing over and over again with just different packaging and to be unique is is something, especially in this AI generated world, so to speak, that 
it is <laughs> it is harder and harder to ha find your unique voice rather than what you know an AI puts out for you. Oh, AI, that's fun stuff. It's so crazy. <laughs> I play. So, I put around with it a little bit just to see what see what we could do. Yeah. And I wonder how well it could draw the Jolly the Jolly and Only characters. I did a couple like oh, samples okay. of like that. All of them came out ridiculous. And it's like, I don't know. I'm not a big AI art at all or AI anything so much. <clears throat> I think it's fine to use like AR for like proofreading of like emails and shit, which is what I do for work. Or like I say, explain this to me, you know. Mm -hmm. And I had it'll, it'll explain to me. That's great. Or like one of the actually one of the best cases for AI I've used for my job. I, I do a lot of API work, a lot of software work. And I'm like, hey, write me an API in this language that does this. And it does it. And most of the time, it's like 90% or more accurate. I only have to change a couple things, but it saves me from like type it all out. So I'm like, this is great. I'll copy this over here. <laughs> That's how I use AI, but I, I, I don't use it very often. I saw when ChatGPT first came on, there was somebody on Kickstarter who kickstarted a, an AI generated comic book. And I was like, what are you doing? That's yeah. not creative. No. On one side, I get, the, there's creativity in coming up with the prompts and like guiding the AI to do stuff. I get, I get that, but it's hard because part of me is like, that's not art, but then I'm like, well, it's just a new type of art that we're not attuned to yet. Mm. Is that going to become an art form in the next 20 years that people are doing AI art versus traditional art, which if they do, then it's going to mean traditional art is going to be more valuable because less people are going to do it. Kind of like how if you're working comic books, if you don't, if you a lot of people in, in comics will draw their pages and art on a tablet in Clip Studio or in Procreate. But the ones who do traditional, their art is usually cost more because they're doing it traditional and they make more money doing it that way. So is that going to happen with AI to where it's not going to become like the AI is the cheapest, digital art is the second cheapest, and then traditional is the, you know, more expensive? Is, is it going to become that kind of a hierarchy? Because as much as we want to hate it, like AI is not going to go away. No. It's not going to disappear. So you either have to either embrace it or learn how to tolerate it at some point, you know, and it's figure out how it's going to mold into our creative world and hope it doesn't fucking ruin everything. <laughs> I hate the fact that the AI art side of things, it literally scrapes the internet for these images yeah. and then allows you to, allows you to modify these set images to your own quote unquote style. And I use that term extremely loosely. Yeah. Uh, Geiger said it best when he was on the show. He was like, he was saying there's no opt out feature or yeah. else you would see thousands upon thousands of people opting out because it's their hard work. It's their experience. Yeah. It's their time. It's their effort. It is the ability to create something from their mind onto a creative platform. And yep. Now an an AI takes it and and use, utilizes it for someone else's possible financial gain. Yeah, uh, the whole the, the fact that it it steals artists' work that's that's the part that pisses me off the most. Yeah. That it's taken it's taking people's work. I think that like they need to figure out how to not do that so much. I mean the beast is the beast is already open. It's like how do you how do you yeah. deal with that? Yeah, and it's annoying. I've seen some AR work where like the guys the person's uh signature is still in the AI work. And it's like, come on, the guy's the guy's signature is still right there from the from the art you stole it from. But... Unless the artists are gonna have to like literally put their their actual yeah. signature in front giant of giant watermarks their work. everything. Yeah, exactly. I don't think Jolie Noli is in, in risk of being stolen by AR AI. So I think we're good. I think I'm good there. <laughs> I think you have the the that process locked up, no no problem when it comes to not only the the verbiage but the characters as well too. So I, I think you'll be all right. What's funny is I dog on the art for this this book so much. I've got. Yeah, I'll turn off, I'll turn off my background real quick so I can show these. I've got the first five issues. I actually I actually already printed them up for myself. I actually got you know all five of the first issues printed up here. Nice. And I dog on the art all the time, but like the pages, they take time like to make to make this stuff. Yeah. This one, like that took a lot of time to like get all the stuff put together. And it's funny because I'm always like, oh, the art's so shitty. But then I'm like, man, there's a lot of work that comes into creating these backgrounds mm -hmm. and to creating all this stuff that I do. And it's like, oh, I guess there is some time it takes to do it. i mean it's not the same as like drawing a page but there's a lot of like figuring out how to make things work i think the biggest thing i do with this book is not necessarily like this sounds bad i don't necessarily plan out the pages as well as most people do i kind of write a loose script and then i just kind of put it together and make things work and if i can't make something work then i figure out how to make something else work what you can see in the pages is a lot of like stuff put in there that you wouldn't expect to be put into a page mm -hmm. because i wanted to make it work <laughs> So it's 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 a lot of fun. It's uh, and you can see that like from issue one on issue one is like very it's, it's simplistic, right? There's 
two or three static backgrounds that don't really move around. And as you go through, the backgrounds get more complex. Things move around in them. There's more interacts, more stuff they interact with. And the characters themselves start moving more. They're not so static. And I start moving and doing like uh, body turns. And like, I play with it. It's like, it's funny because one of the long running jokes for the first 10 issues is the quality of the art. They, they realize over the course of the issues like that their art is not necessarily even better, but they're getting they're able to move more, they're able to do more stuff, they're interacting with more stuff. Like, it's like, oh, things are getting different as they as they progress through. It's not just the same, you know, the same two backgrounds that are in the first issue. So it's it's a lot of uh, me making jokes for that kind of stuff at my own expense. Well, if you can't make fun of yourself, then are you really a creative person? Oh, I mean, it's part of the process, right? <laughs> I like to tell the origin of the name. Those who know me know that my first name is just the letter J. My middle name is just the letter N. They don't mean anything. Uh, I just have a letter for a name and a letter for a middle name. And I am the third. So my dad had the same name and so did my grandfather. And the J only only name comes from, I think it was, I believe it was the late seventies. My dad was getting his, a new social security card and he was on the phone with, with them. And they asked him to spell his name out. And he said, okay, my name is spelled J only N only Horsley Jr. And I said, okay. And he goes, okay, so got it. Just, they got it. We got it. And then a couple weeks later in the mail, he got a social security card that said, Jolene Nolene Horsley Jr. And my mom still has that card somewhere and she's going to get it for me because I want I want it. It came as that. And then for every, since then, it's been, Jolene Nolene has been a running joke in my family. And then it just became like, let's make a comic out of it because it's funny. And it makes me laugh because it's literally somebody not understanding that letters can be names at all, which is funny because letters have been names for a long ass time. Like Johnny Cash's real name is J.R. Like his real name is J, first name, R, middle name. And then he changed to John Cash when he went to the Air Force because they wouldn't accept a letter. It's ridiculous because it's, it's and it's a, it's a huge Southern thing. A lot of people in the South have just like letters for names or just initials. Yeah, It's just funny because even to this day, I have to explain my name to people, which is why I go by John in my professional life is because nobody understands J or J-N. So I'm like, I'll just go by John. It makes it so much easier. <laughs> but in my creative life, I use Jay because that's my real name and I want to go by it. If you were ever to go to a, a foreign country and you were working and living there and you had to go by their standard of naming conventions, it'd be yeah. the exact same. It's the exact same thing as anyone coming to the United States and, and North America. And rather, we should be using their original name. And but because of whatever reason, we don't decide to use that. And I think that's, that's a shame because, you know, you're born with these names. You should have the respect to say their actual names. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for a long time, I went by, I've been by John from most of my adult life. I went by John because nobody could understand J or JN as a name. In high school, I, every teacher, when they got to my name for roll call, would always like, oh, we got, I only have a last name. I'm like, no, you have my full name. Oh, it's just initial. Yep. That's my full name. In St. Anne in college, and I was like, "Why? It has my name. Like, why is it so difficult to have my name?" And then, you know, getting into like the online internet world, like I couldn't make, I couldn't have an online bank account for a long time. Yeah, because you have to use legal name, and they would not accept one letter. You had to have at least two letters to have a name. I'm like, "Here's my birth certificate. I it's my name. Oh, we can't accept that. Cool." And I, I'm pretty sure if like I was online early. But I, I had to lie about my name all the time. But anything official that like you had to have your real name for, I couldn't do until like easily 2003, 2004, because they wouldn't accept a letter. I finally got my bank to do it like when I was like 21 to accept J. And they finally had to change it. I'm pretty sure they changed it for me. Hmm. And I was like, come on, I need to be able to have my freaking online bank account. And like my dad had his bank account because it's under my mom's name, not his name. So he could log in that way. But it's like, come on, man. It's it's people. It's a lot of people have letters for names. It's not just me. Well, Jay, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much once more for coming back on the show. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Kurt. I appreciate it. I always love coming on and talking with you. You come with something new every time, and I can't wait to see what you have next for sure. For those that want to support you and, and look at your work, where can we find you online? And where's the Kickstarter campaign and anything else you'd like to promote? Sure. So the Jolene Only for the Kickstarter, you can just go to jolenelnly.com. So it's J-O-N-L-Y-N-O-N-L-Y.com. That'll take you right to the Kickstarter page. You can read all the stuff there and, and uh, share it out and hopefully support it too. Uh, if you want to find more stuff from me, you can just go to y2cl.net. And that's my main website with uh, my other books and artwork and some other stuff I do there. Pretty much in any social media platform, if you search Y2CL, you're going to find me on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever. I, I, I'm usually always Y2CL or Y2CL.net, depending upon if, the, if they don't allow four characters for a name. 
You can find my podcast by searching anywhere for Spoiler Country on there, on uh, any podcatcher on YouTube. We're doing a lot more YouTube shows, so it's all going to be mostly YouTube from now on. If you want to check out the imprint or publishing company that we're working on that has Jolie Nolan, Ainz, Supernatural Baby Detective, and then all, all of our future books, you can go to Spoilerverse.com and read about it all there and sign up for updates for our future books. Well, like I said, that is this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T-W-O, not the number two. Of course, our YouTube channel is a lot more updated than our website, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia. The podcast is back after 12 or so years. You can search that on twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.